uh, Samuel, S-A-M-U-E-L. Uh, I couldn't speak any English. I couldn't even say hi. My mom was English teacher, and, but I didn't know any English. Without question, the city that I grew up with bears very little resemblance to the Saskatoon that we're in now. Since uh, my change over to EAL, I have had large numbers of students from a variety of cultures. The faces in the classroom of Saskatchewan are really changing. Me and my brother are the only people that I know. I speak Spanish. We've really had an unprecedented number of newcomers uh, to our province in the last eight years or so. Uh, that's literally changing the face of Saskatchewan. There has been a change in the, the cultural diversity in the classroom. Uh, when I first started teaching, the students were coming from countries perhaps more like Australia and, and European countries, but now I'm noticing a lot more students from Asia and Africa. I grew up at China, uh, Qingdao City, and uh, I lived there for eight years. These students are not really unique. We've had 33,000 or so newcomers come to Saskatchewan in the last three years. It will continue to occur. In fact, I think these students represent the new Canadian. Um, out of the 120,000 or so newcomers that we've had uh, come to the province in the last eight years, over half of them have been from outside of Canada. And uh, this level of immigration from outside of Canada really is unprecedented in the last 80 years uh, of the history of Saskatchewan. They didn't really know anything about Canada. In a culture where, where change is slow, the, the ground shifts and the roots grow and people adjust to massive shifts in demographic. But we, we did it in a minute and that that creates cracks that are really big. And either we fall in them, or we, we go to the middle ground and we build them up. It's an opportunity, but it's also, it's also a potential for a problem. Gunmen stormed the offices of Charlie Hebdo. Tried to burn a man to death because he didn't like the color of his skin. Xenophobic crowds killed more than 60 people across South Africa. Accusing the Ferguson police of systematically discriminating against blacks. Turn your vehicle around. <laughs> My name is Robert Weisman, but everybody calls me Robbie and uh, I'm a Holocaust survivor. Um, I, I was sure, listening to some of the grown-ups in the concentration camp, they believed that the Holocaust, the Shoah, that it's called in Hebrew, would teach the world cooperation and understanding and eliminate hatred. And I remember thinking, that's going to be a wonderful world. They were sure that this was the end of it. It will teach the world to, to live together. And for a while, it did. Removed from their families and home communities, seven generations of Aboriginal children were denied their identity. Below this memorial to the 5,000 Tutsi men, women, and children massacred after they sought refuge here from the Hutu militias. This is a month of cruel memories in Cambodia, although the Khmer Rouge is nothing like the large, well-armed force it was when it captured Phnom Penh, people still fear the viciousness, the madness. A simple plaque here in the memorial says, may revenge be turned into justice, may mother's tears be turned into prayers, that there should be no more Srebrenica's. In Canada, we live in a very prosperous country with uh, huge freedoms and strong institutions. And sometimes Canadian citizens take that for granted. Yaga Khan came to Canada in 2010 and said that Canada is the most successful experiment in pluralism the world has ever seen. And he's absolutely right. But there's a fragility attached to that. And that fragility is directly related to the knowledge, understanding, and commitment 
of all Canadians to our multicultural country. And we have to teach that in the schools so that understanding is very clear and explicit because it's very, very valuable. We devalue everyone's human rights if we are not willing to take responsibility to stand and fight for one person's human right. My son called me and, and I hate it when a conversation starts out with, don't worry, mom, everything's okay. <laughs> okay, well, Noah, what are you telling me? Well, it, I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. It's, it's, it's just a little death threat. And it wasn't a little death threat. It was a big death threat. And I, I can't tell you, as I'm describing it to you, I'm feeling overcome with emotion because, because our love for our children is the most visceral, profound feeling we have. And it, it's, we, we are only as happy as our least happy child. And when your son receives a death threat, there is no language to tell you how upset I was on every level. And thank God he's okay. He was protected and he was, and he was wrapped up and looked after by his friends of, of all cultural diversities. But it, it reminded me that this is extraordinary what we see in Saskatoon. It, there's, no, there's nothing else to describe it as, except as extraordinary. But if we don't have more conversations like you and I are having, if we don't create educational opportunities so we can learn about each other, if we keep defining ourselves by, by politics, if we, use, if we use filters that only recognizes our differences and don't start discussing our shared values, more mothers are going to have the kind of experiences that I had, and no mother should have that kind of experience. We have seen examples in, in countries elsewhere, whether that Sweden is an example or France, where you end up with uh, enclaves um, from a, a particular cultural or ethnic origin. Um, you know, I think Canada has done a good job, um, and I think Saskatchewan has done a good job, even even more so, in making sure that we, we aren't seeing that sort of uh, that sort of trend develop, perhaps that existed in other countries. The vast majority of okay. newcomers uh, coming to the province uh, arrive through the Saskatchewan Immigrant Nominee Program, and to the point right now where we have the same uh, number of nominee positions as Alberta, as British Columbia, as uh, other provinces that are much larger than we are in terms of population. But uh, on top of that, it's about a 2.1 multiplier. So. Uh, nearly 12,000 newcomers we expect this year just through our nominee program, and that's not even counting federal immigration streams. Immigration and continued immigration is really critical to the overall economic success of the province. We need to promote that. I know that 53% of all the students who were new that came to the Saskatoon public school system in September 2012 were not born in Canada. In the Catholic school system, it was 56%. That's increasing. This year it's projected that 650 new students coming into the uh, Saskatoon public school system will not have been born in Canada. History tells us people are threatened by difference and by what they don't understand. And, and Saskatoon was a, you know, founded as a temperance colony and we, there was not a lot of diversity and so the evolution of change in, in, invariably included some not understanding what was, who was amongst us. I think it's easy to understand non-malicious ignorance and it's easy to de deal with it. And, and there are lots of great things that we can do and are doing. It's much more difficult to understand a systemic hate. Federal prosecutors revealed data suggesting minorities were unfairly targeted by police. Tensions were high on Jasper Avenue, a white pride group on March clashed with people protesting its presence. You don't want it here. They don't want you here. The Morris Mirror's January 14th edition published this cartoon. Beside it, a comment from the editor calling Aboriginals lazy, corrupt, and terrorists in their own country. Six houses were torched all inhabited by Zimbabweans. In 2008, more than 60 people were killed when South Africans turned on black immigrants, accusing them of taking their jobs. Recognizing that kids who come from countries that have been in conflict in the past really need 
time and understanding of students who've come from those opposing countries. And so part of my role is just um, enabling them to be in a safe place in uh, the school setting and helping them to recognize that, that each person uh, is a potential friend. Yeah. And in the country in which they live now, they have the opportunity to be friends with people that they wouldn't have had an opportunity to be friends with in their uh, former situation. That happened to me, but after Mrs. Yernisi read the book, like, don't make fun of other people's food, they stopped. We call our new pedagogy, our new classroom resources, the new three R's. Rights, responsibility, and respect. What are the rights of citizenship, but also what are the responsibilities that go with those rights? And how do you build and maintain respect for every citizen? Why? Because every citizen, every human being, deserves equal moral consideration. Those are Canadian values. I wanted them to understand the treaty relationship. I wanted them to understand that they were newcomers and that they, were, they had a relationship with First Nations people because of the treaties that were signed. And so while they're learning the, the words purple and blue, they're also learning chicken dancer and grass dancer and things like that. So I really want them to honour First Nations people and Métis people and Inuit people as they're growing and learning uh, how to be citizens of Canada. We're really privileged. I mean, we, we, we have freedoms and rights that the world would literally die to have the opportunities to have. But sometimes we lose sight of our responsibilities. The number of Jews killed was not six million. It was a far smaller number. Jim Keekstra wasn't a quiet voice on the fringe. He was a mayor, a high school principal, and a social studies teacher. There was a, a, uh, a teacher in Eckville, Alberta, by the name of Keekstra. Have you heard of him? Uh, one of the kids came home and told his mother, oh, I just learned that the, the Holocaust never happened. It's just an imagination. And uh, so this mother kicked up a fuss, and he was let go. But when I heard it, it brought back memories for me in the barracks at night, I was trying to fall asleep when a voice addressed me, kid, promise me that if and when you survive, you'll tell the world what you have witnessed here. And I didn't reply. And he repeated that about three times. Then another voice that I heard said, why don't you shut up to this other guy and let us all fall asleep, leave the kid alone. None of us are going to survive anyway, so what are you worried about? And, and so I'm just about falling asleep. Then this first voice says, I haven't heard you promise me. And I wanted him to leave me alone. I said, okay, I promise. And after all these years, Keekstra brought these voices back to me. Would you believe that? Isn't that funny? And I, so I realized that uh, I need to speak about it. Imagine being so brutalized and dehumanized that you begin to believe that you're no longer human. I am a witness to all the horrors. And when they hear my story, they in turn become witnesses as well. And so when they hear me, I'm sure that they go home and tell their parents. And later on in life, when they get married and they have children, they will remember about the horrors of the Second World War because they listened to me. And this uh, really energizes me. And I'll continue doing this for as long as I uh, have the strength. Leaders in France, Germany, Britain, and Sweden have said in the last year that multiculturalism is dead in their countries. Canada is the last bastion of opportunity to get this right. In 2009, a critic of human rights commissions wrote that a proactive human rights commission should work with all ministries of education to try to teach what he called civics in the classroom. We've expanded that. Civics is too narrow. 
what he was speaking about too was just teaching the newcomer students in the classroom and that's fundamentally flawed. We need to teach everyone that comes into the classroom. And this is a larger issue. You know, citizenship is really uh, fundamental to the core of, of being a Canadian. Our teacher is from a different place in the world and she's taught us a lot, a lot about her country. When I first started teaching, the celebrations that we would focus on might have been uh, St. Patrick's Day, St. Valentine's Day, um, Christmas, Easter. Now, uh, we, we still highlight those celebrations, but we also have other celebrations that we'll highlight so that um, children of other cultures will feel that their celebrations are being honored as well. And so Chinese New Year is one that we, we really focus on in our EAL classroom. Um, we've had some great training through our school system in terms of multiculturalism, uh, in terms of um, being culturally responsive. And so I think that uh, teachers are very aware of uh, the language that we use and the way we approach our teaching needs to be inclusive. Some are Muslim and that's cool too because you can learn what they do and what they don't do and how they spell, celebrate heed, where they all come together. Lots of times when you go into classrooms and you talk to children about improving our world, they start to talk about big, big, beefy things. And, and I try to point out that big change can be just a whole series of little steps. And I try to always encourage that small things pile on top of each other to create giant changes. This is Amiel. She's nine years old. She likes to put her hair in, bra in braids a lot. <laughs> this is my friend, Salma, and a good thing about her is uh, she, like, she loves to help people. This is Ariel, what's her last name? John. John? <laughs> Hi. She's funny, and she's our best friend. <laughs> my son's in kindergarten, and my daughter's in, in preschool, and both uh, both of their classes, of course, have, have newcomers um, or the children of newcomers uh, in them. And they don't even uh, bat an eyelash. It's just kind of normal. Uh, children are so resilient. And even my students who've come from war-torn situations, situations where they've been through trauma and major struggles, they come and what they really want is a friend. We have a strong vision of, of what we need to do and how to do it and we've got a great complement of energy. We're a very unique uh, jurisdiction. We only have one million people, but we're very nimble, very flexible, and we've done some really good things, and we've got some more things to do. But I think we're people rich, and we're not jaded, and we still look at the world with a little more openness than other parts of the world. And, and I really believe that we can be an example here. And I believe just, just the interest that you're showing in this is something that, I think if other communities that, that have, are facing a lot of challenges right now had done this kind of deconstruction and, and a more careful analysis of, of, of a community culture, they might not have ended up where they are. And I've spoken to thousands and thousands of teenagers and the feedback I get from them really gives me hope for humanity and I have a lot of faith in them, particularly when you see what's happening in the world. The ends of education will include obviously numeracy and literacy, but the new direction is to include citizenship. It's a third element in building uh, uh, citizens throughout the Western world. And we're leading in the world. Saskatchewan's leading in the world, that's the fact. And I really recognize that as kids see someone new coming to the school, whether they're a newcomer from another country or a newcomer from another school in our city or our province, that they are so willing to reach out. My ancestors were, were welcomed here and, uh, uh, and I think, you know, that's the same way I feel for newcomers coming now, seeking opportunity, um, seeking a, a better life. Uh, many have come from very challenging uh, backgrounds and very challenging uh, locales and uh, you know are very thankful for the opportunity and grateful for the opportunity to make a life here in you know what I think is the best country in the world and the best province and the best country in the world. I don't want them to forget that we live in paradise 
And we should appreciate that and not take it for granted. And that's, I depend on young people to take up the challenge of maintaining what we have that's so precious.